I just leave it as it is. That's it. Okay, good. Okay, perfect. And that, how do you assess uh, how long will be the lecture? Um, More or less. I could, I could do pro probably better to to try to have as much discussion as possible. I'm happy to do. Uh, I don't remember last time was it 50 minutes and then the rest was gone. I'm I'm happy. In, in fact, if you stop me earlier, I'm so happy with that. So I uh, I don't mind at all. Okay. I have roughly, I think, 50 minutes, you know, the usual. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of pictures probably that um, I could uh, go very quickly over as well, or I can come back to them if, um, if there are questions. So I, I think it's quite flexible. Okay, perfect. Dr. Depp just arrived. Oh, Sebastian, yes. Mm -hmm. All right, there are more people coming. So let's wait maybe one or I'm two more minutes. Of course, of course. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, Sebastian. Hi. Thanks for joining. Hi, Pavel, and yeah. hi, Professor, and hi, Helen. Hi. Okay, people are still coming. It's good, good to see you again, Professor, and other people. Thanks for call, yeah. calling me back. I, I'm happy to. I like the the style of, um, of your uh, gathering, and um, I think it's good to encourage discussions of this kind as much as possible. Perfect. Mm-hmm. I think you you have a lot of things to say to so about quantum mechanics and quantum computing. So you can give yes, give, give us I'm, more than two or three. I'm I'm happy to to come back every once uh, in a while as um, as we are doing it. Uh, you are right. There are many interesting uh, directions in the field, and um, um, it's expanding uh, quite a bit. Um, and each of the subfields. Uh, are growing so so certainly I could talk about other topics as well you right? mm -hmm. good uh Helen do you think we should start or shall we wait sure okay and Pavel, Pavel, just one second do we have this uh, connection on the YouTube channel yes, yes. Uh, Helen okay. told me that it's live streamed on oh, YouTube okay okay so okay. just start yeah, we can we can start recording. All right, so let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the next uh, meetup organized jointly by quantum computing groups from Washington, D.C., Toronto, and Warsaw. Uh, my name is Pavel Gora, and I will be a moderator of this event together with Dr. Sebastian Zions. We are both from uh, from Poland, from Q Poland. And today we have pleasure to uh, host for the next time our great speaker, Professor Vlad Kovedral. And today uh, he will give a talk titled uh, The Pseudo Density Matrix Formulation in Quantum Physics. Uh, so, just to let you know, uh, this uh, lecture will be recorded and uh, hopefully the video will be later available on our YouTube channel. And there's also live streaming, of course. If you have any questions, uh, we've agreed with Vladko that uh, you can also interrupt. So please just raise your hand and uh, we can, we'll try to ask the question. You can also post your questions on the chat. So at the end, there will be also Q&A session and time for discussions. So whatever is uh, better for you. Uh, before we start, uh, we'd also like to announce uh, some of our next uh, meetups. So in next week on Sunday this time, uh, Dr. Uh, Vicente Leighton Ortega um, will also give a talk about quantum computing and machine learning, uh, navigating potential and understanding limitations. 
Then in March, uh, Ed Yunis uh, will give a talk about compiling resource efficient programs with numerical instantiation. And uh, later in March, Dr. Brad Green uh, will give a talk about the Landau level phases of uh, bilayer graphen. And then in April, uh, Eric Reiter will tell us about the serious challenge to quantum mechanics and its implications. And then in May, uh, again, together with Sebastian, we'll moderate uh, the talk by Dr. Uh, Bruna Araujo about moving towards compactification uh, of the many body uh, a wave function using a bottom up approach. And finally, on May 12th, Dr. Uh, Edo uh, Justo will talk about quantum reliability, uh, circuit uh, susceptibility faults, and integration issues. So, as you know, this meetup is organized by uh, several organizations. So, we'd like to thank our partners and sponsors. And with this, I will stop sharing my slides. And uh, uh, Professor Vedral, if you are ready, the Zoom is yours and we can start. So, thank you for accepting our invitation. Pleasure. Um, let me thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, let me share the screen. Um, I think. Um, um, like I said, I very much enjoy um, uh, the style of your gathering, uh, that it's um, uh, informal, and I think um, it looks like really that you're doing it um, just for fun and um, out of interest um, in in the various issues related to quantum information and computation. So um, uh, this time I'd like to talk about um, another probably fundamental topic in the sense that um, it's um, an exploration of yet another formulation of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, and I'd like to first spend maybe a couple of slides just justifying um, um, why one might want to do that and, and what the motivations are. Um, there are many different um, versions of, of quantum uh, physics, as we all know. Um, um, even, even within what one might call the standard um, formulations, we, of course, have the various pictures, as we call them, the Schrodinger, the Heisenberg, uh, which are different in the sense that, of course, in one of them, the states evolve, in the other one, the observables evolve. We have the interaction. Anything in between is also possible. There are really infinitely many uh, pictures already from that perspective. Um, uh, the other... The other point here, that's point number three uh, here, is that when you have a reversible evolution, and that's true classically as well, of course, um, you are automatically um, faced with even the choice of uh, the boundary conditions. So usually we talk about, and, and, and that kind of feels natural to us because we um, psychologically or otherwise think of time as um, going forward in some sense, whatever this may uh, mean. But, um, um, of course, uh, there is no reason why you should just have the dynamical equations and the initial state of your system, which is how we think about it uh, in physics in general. Uh, every time you have a reversible evolution, you can actually do whatever you like. You can, in fact, specify the final state, as you know, of your system, and then reverse the evolution backwards to the time t, which matters to you, the, the now, if you like. Um, and again, like with, with different pictures of quantum mechanics, um, you have uh, infinitely many ways of combining the forward and the backward uh, propagating. And that, that's, of course, because it's a deterministic, um, a deterministic reversible uh, dynamics. So basically, you can take half of the forward propagating um, boundary condition, if you like, and half the backward propagating. And maybe I will comment on that as well, because these are all different ways of treating um, temporal correlations. Then, of course, in quantum field theory, um, we have relativity to take into account. Um, most of what I have to say will, will be really a formulation of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I think um, it is um, very straightforward. Um, it would seem to me to, to generally this to relativity. And maybe I, I make a few comments or we can discuss that if it, um, if it comes up uh, in our discussions. But 
when we talk about uh, quantum field theory, of course, we are saying that it arose out of the need um, to um, to make um, the laws of quantum mechanics um, comply with um, with uh, relativity, with the symmetries, if you like, of relativity, with the, with the Poincaré group um, in relativity. Um, and and the reason for all of these multitudes of phrase uh, of of uh, of approaches to um, to phrasing uh, dynamics um, is simply, um, of course, someone might say, but look, they all agree on all of these things, and and it's indeed true that the way we phrase them at the moment is that, of course, at least we try to recover all the results that we uh, know so far. Um, but just like with different formulations of classical mechanics, you know, we have the Newtonian formulation, the Lagrange, the Hamilton then, um, they all gave the same results. Um, but spiritually, so to speak, they were very different. What, they, what, what kind of picture of reality they painted was very different. And as we know, Hamilton was the, the key stepping stone uh, simply because Hamilton wrote uh, the laws of mechanics in the same way as uh, the laws of waves. Uh, so that was already the mathematics was there to unify waves and particles. And of course, that's what uh, quantum mechanics is all about. So e even though what I will say today, um, it, it's not going to give you anything different to what we know so far. Um, the main justification, as far as I'm concerned, is really that understanding one and the same thing in as many ways as possible is what we do most of the time in physics. You know, if, if you look at the fundamental physics, it hasn't changed for 100 years. We've, we've got two extremely successful theories. Um, and the reason why we keep uh, rewriting them and trying to understand them differently is because we don't know. M maybe maybe one of these approaches will turn out to be more useful. Um, of course, already in the early days, this is maybe the, the second part um, of the of the motivation, uh, and like I said, I'm not going to go into relativity, but I, but I'm trying to motivate a, a, this unified approach to space and time um, through relativity as well. But like I said, most of it will be non-relativistic, and, and and there are some interesting parallels even in in that direction. But in the early days, I, I think people like Heisenberg already and and Max Born, in particular, were already saying that. In the light of understanding uh, what quantum mechanics is all about, what the atomic structure is all about, they had matrices, matrix mechanics in, in mind at that time. Uh, and they would speak about relativity as something they should hold in the macroscopic domain, clearly. Uh, however, they were expressing very strong doubts whether relativity, the, just the concepts of space and time, make any sense really at the, at the quantum level. Uh, and of course, the, the way that Heisenberg came up with his revolutionary paper was exactly to question whether you can even sensibly talk about orbits in the way that Niels Bohr talked about them in the old quantum theory. And by giving up the notion of orbits and only talking about transitions between different uh, quantum numbers, that's basically how he came up uh, with matrices. Uh, the intuition there is simply that um, if you really think of straight lines, um, in in physics as being defined uh, by objects that move freely uh, without any force. And so I'm excluding gravity now. I'm really talking about um, special relativity only. Then we know that in quantum mechanics, um, uh, no object ever travels really in a straight line. There's always some kind of wave-like behavior, the dispersion, the spreading of the wave packet, as, as we call it. And that spread may be tiny if the, if the particle is big. But as you're making these things smaller and smaller, the effect, of course, becomes bigger and bigger. So even what we call, here I drew a, a, the usual picture of space-time diagram, Minkowski space-time, and, and I'm talking about the light cone uh, which is basically everything that the uh, event E1 uh, on this picture could affect in the future. Everything outside of this cone would require um, larger than the speed of light uh, propagation of signals, and it's impossible. However, these boundaries are, of course, straight lines, and that makes sense in classical physics because classical uh, particles, rays of light, if you like, travel in straight lines in geometrical optics, but they don't really travel 
um, no particles, in fact, um, uh, can travel in uh, perfectly in straight line. They can approximate them, but not perfectly. And and the question is, you know, what does this really mean? Um, and and I think various people have speculated in different ways what would happen if you really quantized space time, if you included um, space time. Um, with a full quantum description of operators, the way that we treat um, other elements in in physics. So that's certainly part of the motivation. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go back and 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 present something much much simpler than than, than any of this. And I want to talk about a formulation. These pseudo densities are like density matrices. Uh, but they are extended notions in time as well. So rather than just capturing correlations in space, let's say you have two qubits and you write all possible correlations between different measurements of the two qubits. So you can measure x, y, and z, one qubit, x, y, or z, let's say Pauli um, spin matrix on the other qubit. Uh, and then you put them together, you form the correlation matrix, and that gives you the full state. Uh, of the two qubit system. What I'm going to do now, and, and that's the idea with pseudo density matrices, is that we would like to extend that to the temporal domain as well. Uh, so, what that means, for instance, and, and I think that the simplest example that you can have now is a single system, single qubit. Um, and rather than having two qubits measured, um, at two different locations, if you like. Now I'm having a single qubit, which I measure at two different times. So I would like to pretend in some sense, and we know that this is not true, and you will see the, the word pseudo is a consequence exactly of, of, of negating what I'm about to say. But we know that we can't treat different instances of time in the same way in quantum mechanics as different locations in space. Different locations in space would be what the field theorists would call different modes. You can have a particle at x1 or a particle at x2, and they are different <laughs> modes. You assign them different Hilbert spaces. There is a tensor product between different Hilbert spaces. And the tensor product simply tells you that you can do whatever operation on one of these subsystems without ever disturbing any other subsystem. So tensor product is an expression of what one might call locality in physics. Locality Man. in the sense that if I localize my operations on one system, I can rest assured, let's say, that I'm not really touching, changing anything else. There, there is some question, so maybe... Yes, of course. there's, please there's do, a please question. Do. Excellent, excellent. Please do. Uh, Itamar? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yes. So maybe before Itamar, uh, you want to put just one remark that uh, when you show you this. Hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, we yes. can hear you now. Yes, please go on. Okay. okay. I want to go back to this light cone and straight lines. And if I live in a world that is only PDEs. So there at the very beginning, first lesson, people talk to me about characteristic lines. Are these characteristic lines can be understood in the terms of the picture that you depicted there? Few a, this is a good question. In fact, that um, uh, I, I, I wasn't really um, intended to, I, I think it's a beautiful discussion to be had. It's not going to be directly relevant for, for what I um, will say. It, it, it's mainly as a motivation. But I think what you're asking is whether when we treat, uh, let's say, even in special relativity, Minkowski space-time, as some kind of background, um, is that really just a very crude approximation? Uh, could we retain that? Is that really the, the logic that we can always choose some kind of uh, description in the background, um, divorced more or less of the physicality? Or is it that this background must also be dictated 
by the laws of physics. You know, there was a, there was a very beautiful um, statement by Newton, right, in, in one of his writings that, that straight lines don't, don't exist in, in an abstract mathematical, uh, maybe he meant platonic world, but straight lines uh, exist because freely propagating particles travel in straight line. Newton thought about it very physically. You know, information is physical kind of thing. He was maybe one of the one of the earliest information theorists. Uh, in Everything physics. is curvature. Ah, in, in, indeed. In in GR, you have an extra complexity there. Uh, I, 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 I haven't thought about that within this context at all. Indeed. Um, if you go in GR, your straight lines now become geodesics, of course. Yes. Uh, and, and, and I haven't thought about this at all. And I think the same, uh, the same question applies. And I think it's a big discussion um, in, in the circles of people who uh, think about quantizing gravity. What to do with this? Is this really background necessary? Is it just an approximation and so on? I think it's a very deep question. I, I, I don't have an answer to that. Straight line may be considered as some kind of projection of geodesy. It could be. Even that. But the question is maybe, um, can the projection then, should you think about the projection as something that's executed by some physical means? Can you even that think That depends of... what you project on. Yes. Yes. This is a little bit along the lines of, for instance, um, you you can have a spreading of the wave packet in quantum mechanics, but you can also arrange it so that you monitor the system very frequently, so that you don't really allow it to spread. You are kind of forcing the system; you're projecting it back, as as you say, into a straight line. So then, may the I ask is, about the density concept, the density matrix? That's coming up. That's yeah, what the question that. about density matrix is what about if that matrix becomes sparse? And in that sense, what are we, what, in what sense are we talking about density? Oh, let me, let me, let me go into that if, if I can. I just, I'm just conscious of the fact that there could be other questions that are related to this. So I don't know if anyone wants to, because I will answer what you're, what you're saying. I will, I will, I will talk about densities now. Thanks. But is there any, any other question that? that yeah, I, I, I have question or my, maybe more remarks that in, if you just show this diagram before, uh, is, uh, is that uh, you in this picture we mix two two things yes because when you have this line for uh, light this is as we we assume that particles it doesn't matter if it is light or not are pointless by point so this is the reason why you have this line but because everything is point and yes. in the in this in uh, the second picture you mix it with a uh, Something which is wave package, which is not point. Exactly. So, uh, and this this line is not a projection. This line is mean value of this. Uh, You're right. Of the, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, so there is an even an issue exactly yeah. as you said. How is this line even executed? What does this really mean? And there is a big difference indeed um, between letting the wave packet spread and and not um, interacting with it at all. Um, and of course, continuously, even maybe monitoring the wave packet in order to uh, possibly localize it as much as possible. Um, so all I'm saying is that somehow maybe there is an issue um, um, regarding the fact how we combine quantum mechanics and, and relativity in the first place, even though, of course, field theory does it um, um, as, as best so far as, as we know. And in fact, um, it hasn't been contradicted by by anything so far. Um, yeah, and, and but this, this is only so far only a motivation. Yeah. I don't think whenever I go uh, proceed to say it will be largely independent of this to 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 some degree. And may, maybe just one thing that uh, this different kinds of pictures you said about classical mechanics came f exactly from this picture that we describe physics from locally. Pers 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 perceptions and globally yes. perceptions, and this is this is why general relativity could be 
and there is a lot of work so how to quantize this general yes. relativity and how to get it yes yes i agree and, and we we inherit um uh, you're right many issues that already occur there um even in the in the in the classical setting because even in the classical setting you have um um, as you said, you know there, there there are ways of doing it which are maybe more conducive to fields and relativity like Lagrange. But even Hamilton, for instance, uh, you could think of as containing ultimately some kind of timeless uh, approach to classical physics. So I think there are many. You're right. There are many already many things that we inherit um, from from these issues. And we uh, import them into into quantum gravity discussions. Yes. Yeah, but I think that we can go to this uh, density matrix. Problems. Let's talk about because, the density yes. matrix now. Yes. And so basically, what I have in mind really is is um, is simply um, to now treat um, two. So I have a single system. Uh, let's make it a single qubit to make it as simple as possible. And measure this qubit at t1 time and then let it evolve. In, 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 in this example, I'm even going to consider that the evolution is trivial, its identity. Nothing happens between the first and the second. It's as simple as that. So I measure one observable at t1. I wait. I wait as much as I like because there is no, there is no dynamics in between. And then I measure another observable. So I could initially measure x, y, or z, and then I could at the next time measure x, y, or z. I'm treating it exactly as though you would measure two qubits. So of course, to get the full statistics, I need to prepare an ensemble of qubits, identically prepared ensemble. And then on the first qubit, I measure x at t1, x at t2. On the second qubit, I measure x at t1, y at t2. And then I proceed and I construct the full set of things that I need um, for this. And as you know, we need 15 numbers. If, you, if we think of this single qubit as two qubits, one at t1 and another one at t2, and, and I want to construct it in that way, that's my density matrix, the correlations between t1 and t2. Um, outcomes, then it's going to look like, if I write it uh, as a 4x4 four four matrix, it's going to look like what we call a density matrix of two qubits. It contains all the correlations, um, as well as all the... Sorry, not go. Yes. Sorry, these two qubits you treat as uh, one system or two separate systems or two connected I'm, I'm, systems? I'm going to write them exactly as, as, uh, as, as I do two qubits in space. That's going to be exactly um, the violation, if you like, of the of the temporal logic, which will lead to why these are not density matrices, but they are what I call pseudo density matrices, and that's what I want to explain now. So when you put them in what looks like a density matrix, density matrix is a Hermitian operator; it's an observable. It's got positive or non-negative, if you like, eigenvalues. This is what we think of as probabilities for various outcomes. Um, so basically, and of course, you normalize it that they add up to one. So the trace of row is one, um, and row is emission as well as um, positive, which means mathematically there are no negative um, eigenvalues. And now when I do this with single qubit, but evolving in time, and I measure it at two different times, something interesting happens, and that's what I want to tell you here. If whatever I measure at instant one, if there is no dynamics in between, I must get the same measurement outcome at the instant two. That's called the repeatability hypothesis or requirement or axiom in quantum mechanics. If I make two successive measurements and nothing happened in between, I have to get exactly the same result the second time that I observed the first time, it wouldn't make sense if anything else happened uh, and there was no cause for that. So if I measure x initially and I get plus x, then the next measurement must give me plus x on the same qubit. Then on the next qubit, I measure x. Let's say I get minus x 
if I measure x again, I must get the minus eigenvalue the second time. The first measurement is simply a state preparation, if you like that language. I, I, I don't like any of that. I'm not a Copenhagen person, but let me, let me use it. Uh, maybe it's helpful here. So the first measurement is state preparation. The second measurement simply verifies whatever state you prepared the first time. Therefore, xx correlation, yy, zz, or anything, anything, here you just need the, the full basis. So I'm going to use the usual Pauli basis, x, y, and z at t1, x, y, z at t2, and that's it. The weird thing about this now is that the signature of the correlation is plus one, plus one, plus one. And this state does not exist. There's no equivalent of this in space. There is, there is the state we call singlet state, which is minus one, minus one, minus one. It's anti-correlated perfectly. And there are the triplet states where they have one minus sign and two plus sign, uh, one minus and two plus signs. So they always have odd parity, if you like, physical states. However, this state can be perfectly correlated not perfectly anti -core. that's obvious, because we are doing temporal measurements. And so that's interesting. And why is that interesting? Because if you write it down as a density matrix, and this now, this defines what I mean by a density matrix. If you start with a maximally mixed state even, so my input state is, is maximally depolarized. It's, it's exactly an equal mixture of any two states you, you care to um, write it in. The basis doesn't matter, of course, it, it, it's completely isotropic. Um, what the state would be, if you want to capture all of these measurements at T1 and T2, it would look like one quarter. One quarter is there for the normalization. Again, I'm insisting that the sum of the diagonal elements equals one. The same as a density matrix, a normal two spatial qubits density matrix. It's also a Hermitian operator. You can see it by inspection. I'm using a Hermitian basis. It's a tensor product of these Hermitian operators. It's yet another Hermitian operator. So it shares two of the three features with the density matrix, with the standard density matrix. However, this state has a negative, one negative and three positive eigenvalues. That's interesting. So we can't think of them as probabilities. And of course, we can't think of them as probabilities because Measurements in time don't commute. That's the whole point. That physically, the reason why we have a negative eigenvalue is because doing x followed by y, if you like, it's not the same as y followed by x. If you had two spatially separated qubits, this would be the same. It doesn't matter. The measurements on one qubit commute. Um, with all the measurements on another qubit. That's the whole, p whole point of the tensor product structure. Now, I'm insisting on extending the tensor product to the temporal domain. And of course, something has to go wrong. And what goes wrong is the fact that the resulting operator is not positive. Not always positive. Sometimes it ends up positive, and that's what I want to show you. There are lots of I uh, interesting consequences of this. So that's that's the basis of what I mean by a pseudo-density matrix. Ultimately, now I will extend it to any number of measurements in space, any number of measurements in time, and I'm just going to write the pseudo-density to capture all the correlations in space and all the correlations in time. It's like a pseudo-density matrix of the universe, if you like. I'm going to include everything. That, that's the spirit. Of that. That's a, a bit of a spirit of the block universe in general. Activity. I include everything, all the events that have happened, that will happen, and that are happening. Mm -hmm. But of course, I only did it with the qubit now. And okay. another interesting, sorry, go ahead. Yes, there, yes there, there was yeah, there was one more question on the chat uh, from George. Uh, uh, doesn't the first measurement change the system? So there was also the answer from Sebastian. But absolutely, absolutely, yes. It started as a maximally mixed state. The first measurement, of course, projects it into one of the of the two in this case, because it's a qubit, but you can generalize it. One of the two eigenstates. Um, like I said, if you measure x, it's either plus x or minus x. And then you wait 
you can include the unitaries as well. In my description, I will show you how to do the full quantum mechanics with this. Actually, you can, you can do anything you like. But at the moment, just to explain it, I'm looking at the trivial image. Nothing happens between measurement one and measurement two, which is why if you measure the same observable at the next time, you must get the same result. If you measure another observable, the correlation must vanish, precisely because x and y and x and z are completely uh, uncorrelated in time. If you first, if, if you have a eigenstate of x at the first measurement, then the outcome to y is 50-50 random and z. So x and y cannot be correlated in time. x and z cannot be correlated. All cross correlations vanish. And the only correlations that remain are x, x, y, y, and z, z. Or whichever basis you choose. You don't have to choose the x, y, and z, but it's just a, it's, it's a very convenient, complete basis, if you like. What's interesting for quantum info people that intrigued me immediately <coughs> is that the pseudo density matrix of, of a single qubit measured twice in time, which means let's call that two temporal qubits is in fact the partial transpose. Many of you will know that partial transpose is known as the paris horodetsky criterion to entanglement. Basically, if you take a partial transposition and get a negative eigenvalue, you will know that your initial state was entangled. And interesting, sorry, interestingly, the way to get to the pseudo density matrix is exactly as I wrote. Take a triplet state, take a state zero, zero, <laughs> plus one, one, do a partial transpose, and you will get what I call the pseudo. It's exactly the pseudo density matrix that I wrote on the previous slide. So that's, that's where the negative eigenvalue comes from, mathematically speaking, if you like. It's a partial transpose of an allowed physical state. And all pseudo states in time, you can obtain them. Um, all extremal states you can obtain, if you like, as partial transpose of the relevant yes. basis entangled state. And so that's that's also interesting. Sorry, tell me if there is another question. May I ask? Yes, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. One is the vanishing correlations after the measurements related to the collapse of the wave function and the actually vanishing of the whole state that we prepared after, after the measurement is vanishing? Uh, good question. Uh, you can think of it like that. Again, like I said, I don't like the, the language of um, the collapse of the wave function because I, and I think I have one of the latest slides uh, you okay, accepted, accepted. The other question is, from before, is the localization related to the fact that we deal with quantum, which means small scale in the first place? Um, one hopes that I, I understand what you mean. The question is whether... Um, when we talk about something being confined to a certain small region, exactly. Um, uh, I, I personally, again, this is my uh, my personal bias. Uh, I think quantum mechanics uh, holds it at all scales, as far as uh, experiments are telling us so far. Uh, however, some of these effects may simply be harder and harder to see in the macroscopic domain. So. Um, it, uh, if by being quantum, if it's localized, you mean that um, quantum effects become more relevant and more pronounced, then I would agree with that. Um, but I, I tend to think of everything as being quantum mechanical. Um, so you, can... strive, you strive at universality across scales. That's it. That's it. Okay. I would argue for that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And maybe I have one technical question because you have some and uh, of three operators which are not commute. Is there exist a eigenstate? Eigenstate. For, uh, sorry, this is this... 
Yeah, I was maybe being careless here. The product here is the tensor product. They are really I treat T1 as, as one mode, as one subsystem, and T2 as another subsystem. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the density matrix is. Uh, so I don't have any problems in the notation with the fact that they don't commute. Uh, it's completely okay. Uh, but the price to pay for forcing time instances to be different subsystems, that's not how we conventionally think in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, we have subsystems in space and we evolve them in time. But now I'm including time, temporal measurements into my description. I want to include all the correlations, both space and time. But the price to pay, like I said, for having time being treated in the same way as space is that I'm enforcing this tensor product structure on time, which is what leads to the negative eigenvalue. So if you simply write this as a tensor product, this state, um, this state, if you write it as a tensor product, um, you and, and then you si simply find the eigenvalues of the four by four matrix the same way as you would do uh, anything. But basically, it's a matrix that uh, that will have um, something like um, um, it will have um, one half, one half, one half. There will be three eigenvalues which are equal to one half and one eigenvalue which is equal to minus one half. So the sum will still be one. But if you think of them as probabilities, you will have a, an issue there because one of these is always a negative number in a pseudo density. Not always in this case, in the in the extreme case of maximum correlations. So it's very interesting. You could call this like a, the, the anti-stimulant, if you like. The state that's exactly the opposite correlated to the thing that is always anti-correlated and this is always correlated. So so these products here I should I should again say are are tensor products. I, I, I'm not multiplying yeah, yeah. them. Result. Okay, but uh, but I ask about this sum. I mean that you have oh. two, three different kinds of operators, yes, and this op sum of operators is has some uh, eigenstates for yes, this, yes. for x and y. You have different uh, eigenstates, yes. So as yes, yes, this is not a this is not a problem because I'm looking at the whole thing as as a, it's a Hermitian operator, mm. so okay. it has orthogonal uh, spectrum. And it has real um, eigenvalues. So th there is no problem. I understand the question now. You are worried that maybe when you uh, when you uh, when you try to diagonalize this, something funny will happen. Uh, but but in fact, this is a mission operator. When you sum them up, each of okay. them is a mission operator. So there is no problem at all of that kind. In, okay, in, in fact, indeed, that's what the tensor product uh, resolves that problem. But the problem that it introduces is that you cannot think of the diagonal elements as probabilities anymore because you're going to run into this problem of negative. I, I know there are people thinking about negative probabilities as well, but, but at, the, at the moment, let's say that that, that doesn't, doesn't make sense in this case, which is why I call them pseudo, pseudo yeah, there's one, to... There's yeah, one go, more go question. Ahead. Okay, this a question from, uh, from Gervis uh, on our chat. Can you explain correlation uh, of x, uh, y, oh. and uh, z in time. Is this notion of correlation uh, yes. related to collinearity? Mm -hmm. It's a standard for, yeah, yeah. I, should, I could even define it, in fact, we, because we have, uh, we have um, enough time for, uh, for these discussions to exactly chat about these things. So what I mean by correlation is I simply um, multiply the probability to obtain the two results. So probability that I will obtain one result at T1 and some result at T2. Let's say probability that I will obtain plus X at T1 and plus X at T2 times the product of the values that I obtain at T1 and T2. So it's a, it's a standard definition in statistics, if you like, of correlations. So if I get plus one at T1 at plus one at T2, that simply is plus one times plus one multiplied by the probability. And then I go through all the outcomes for xx. When I get minus one, 
then as we concluded in this simple scenario, I will also get minus one next time. So then it's minus one times minus one, which is also plus one, multiplied by the probability to get that. And as it happens, the probability is one half. The first outcome come plus plus is one half, minus minus is one half. And because both of them multiply to one, you can see that they sum up to a unity. So it's simply the expected value of the products of the values at T1 times the value at T2. It's a standard definition of, of operator correlations in, in time. And that's why, that's why it's always a perfect correlation. If you have nothing else to, to change the system, to rotate the basis in between the two measurements, then they've got to agree 100% uh, uh, between the two measurements. That, that, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. And okay, of course, uh, if, if, I should say, if there is a dynamics in between, you can include that too. Uh, okay. Then you simply uh, you have correlations be between whatever your basis was rotated into from the initial measure. So even that's not difficult to trace at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so Jervis, I hope that it answers your question, but if not, you can also unmute and, and ask. Of course, of course. Of course. Uh, there is a but, second question. There is a second question. Yes, uh, so there was a, the second question. In this scenario, are X, Y, and Z functions functions of time? Um, X, Y, and Z, you can think of them because I'm always I'm always thinking of uh, uh, the same ordering as you would do in space. So whatever operator I write first is the one that was measured at T1. And whatever operator I write on the right, if you like, in the tensor product, that's the operator that's measured at T2. So if, if, if that's what you mean by functions of T1 uh, at T2, then yes. Certainly, if you have dynamics, then it does matter, of course, because your state changes. And by how much your state has changed um, will determine, of course, the outcome, the, the, the probabilities for various outcomes at different times. So yes, it is a function of time. And you can dissect the time as much as you like. I'm not even going, I'm kind of assuming here that you're doing these discrete measurements in time, but I'm not specifying how discrete uh, they need to be. And of course, this is always relative to the dynamics. Then if your dynamics is very fast, then your measurements maybe should be uh, either commensurate or faster than that and so on. But even if they're not, you can include that in this description. A any of these are, are, are possible. Mm -hmm. Itamar wanted to ask one more question. Yeah, please. I have a question. Is multiple eigenvalues, multiplicity of eigenvalues, and spectral gap are problems here or not? And uh, no, no, yeah, I understand. Um, not not a problem for for this case at all. Indeed, there is a, a threefold degeneracy here. Like I said, so three of these eigenvalues are, are plus a half, um, and the other one is a minus a half. And I think, of course, there is a gap there. Um, and and not, none of this is a problem. For in in fact, it's something that you expect uh, if you really start to treat. Um, instances in time as different Hilbert spaces, if you like, different subsystems. So it's not a problem. Fantastic. Now... Uh, so it, Itamar, you had muted. Yeah. About commuting and not commuting, I have the question because I thought that if it's non-commuting, it's producing something, okay, as opposed to being conserved when it is commuting and gives zero. And then you mentioned at some point no dynamics, but then in recent sentences, you invoke dynamics. So yes. Yes, you can include you can include dynamics by simply, of course, the dynamics, for instance, will alter your correlations. Imagine, uh, 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 let me give you a very trivial example. Imagine that your dynamics um, simply is some kind of rotation of the basis. So let's say your, your X basis changes into your Z basis. Just, just one, one possibility here. Then instead of having the maximum correlation between X, X measurements um, at different times, you will now, of course, the first X measurement 
will now be correlated perfectly with the Z measurement at the next time because your evolution has actually changed your X eigenvalues into your Z eigenvalues. So that's really what the pseudo density would then do. It would simply include into the new correlations um, the fact that you had a rotation, you had a unitary transformation in between these two. So if you had this kind of change of basis, your X would no longer be um, would no longer be correlated at all uh, with the x at t2, simply because your x at t2 has now become z through this rotation. And any rotation, it doesn't have to be x into z, it could be by any angle. Any unitary transformation on the block sphere, if you like, uh, could be included um, into, into the description of these correlations. That's not a problem. Also okay. translation, of course. Oh, of course, yes. Yeah, so I have a, another And question. I haven't gone, I should say, I should say this is all at the moment um, completely non-relativistic. So I haven't, I, I, I think that you can, you can make these correlations comply with, with, uh, with the point correct group. I, I don't think that's a problem. So because I'm writing it really, um, I can ultimately include spatial qubits as well as different measurements in time. And that's what I want to, uh, want to show you in a bit. I think I haven't insisted on any symmetries in 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 space time, uh, but okay. you can you, you can do that. But at the moment, I'm not taking. It's simply non-relativistic at the moment. Okay, beautiful. I have one more about trajectories. If I imagine trajectories and moving in space and in time, and there is variety of trajectories. So how about time reversal, I understand, but how about space reversal in this trajectory picture that I have? I can, maybe, maybe I can revisit and mention that uh, when I uh, show you, um, I think I will show you um, a pseudo-density matrix which includes two spatial qubits, standard spatial qubits. And one of these qubits is measured twice in time. So it looks like a description of three qubits. But two of these qubits are genuine, spatially separated qubits. And the third qubit arises from one of the two qubits being measured for the second time, exactly like the qubits that we've been discussing so far. And then I think you can talk about um, space uh, symmetries as well. Uh, like I said, I haven't done it. I haven't had any need to to go in that direction yet. I, I haven't generalized this, but it seems to me you could insist on these symmetries and, and insist that your pseudo-density matrices obey these symmetries. It's an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't really done that, but I, I kind of suspect it shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Great. I think we can go on. Great. So let me let me make one again. This is uh, I, I said I wasn't going to talk about relativity, but let let me make an observation that is interesting here because this two the density matrix has this interesting property that it that it, somehow we get it for free, even non relativistically, as I keep emphasizing. But we get this kind of funny um, Lorentzian. You know the the Minkowski signature, where you have three eigenvalues which are positive, and one of them really um, is negative. So I wrote this the usual interval, as we call it in special relativity, where you add up space as you would in Euclidean geometry, x squared plus y squared plus z squared. However, time sometimes people think of time as being imaginary defined as i times time, if you like, the square root of minus one, in which case the square of that is, that's a nice mathematical way of incorporating, the square of that is, is a negative number. And what's interesting, so, so I'm simply drawing parallels, I'm not saying, um, it, 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 you know, that there is a reason for this, and the reason is mathematical, but whether, whether there is a more physical reason behind this, I don't know. It's just, it's just an interesting thing, and I think many people have commented on on this. But one thing I want to tell you about is that this um, uh, kind of imaginary aspect of time, 
the fact that time enters the metric with a minus sign leads in relativity to the violation of what one might call triangle inequality. So if you think of this as a distance measure, x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared as, as a distance measure, then we know in relativity that you can have two events which are separated by, let's say, a light ray, which means they are null, the distance between them is zero. Then you have other two events between which the distance is zero. However, the events one and three are separated by a finite distance. So actually, what's interesting about the Minkowski um, geometry, unlike Euclidean geometry, is that one of these equalities, inequalities that we think of as fundamental in Euclidean geometry, the triangle inequality, that going straight between two points is shorter than going via another point, is not true in relativity, of course. Now, you can now say, wait a second, you told us that there is a negative eigenvalue also um, in the pseudo-density matrix. Does that mean that there is some kind of triangle inequality uh, that's violated in quantum mechanics as well? And the answer is yes, and that's, that's interesting. And I want to tell you about that too. Um, it's a kind of Bell inequality in time. Instead of measuring different observables on two separated subsystems and concluding that the correlation cannot be reproduced by any local classical hidden variables, classical numbers that are specified locally. Here, we're going to do the same thing, but we're going to measure the same, one and the same system at T1 with multiple observables in, in an ensemble way, and then at T2 with multiple. So not just X, Y, and Z now, but I will show you what kind of observables I have in mind. And that's interesting. And what's going to be the consequence of this is that you will violate the, the, the triangle inequality. In fact, you will violate it quantum mechanically maximum. I will show you that one side goes to zero, the distance is zero, whereas the other side is maximum, distance is one, if, if you define that as, as the maximum. Very similar to relativity, what I said, that you can have two distances which are zero, but the sum of these two, if you go straight between the events, is actually a finite. They could be time separate. So now plus now, um, is actually suddenly greater than, or less than, um, going directly um, in a time-like fashion. Interesting. So let me let me let me let me give you this version of temporal Bell inequality. Some people call this the legged guard inequality. There are all sorts of names, but I like to think of them as ultimately Bell inequalities. Excuse so what, me. Yes. Go ahead. Um, it, I'm just observing the the equation of distances. For uh, the second term, do you mean B sub 2 or B sub 1? I'm kind of confused. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm, uh, let, let me explain the notation because you're right. It's it's a bit confusing here. Um, wh wh I, I, I call them A and B measurements um, in a sense like Alice and Bob, as though I had two separate uh, qubits. But A simply pertains to the first instance in time, and B, Bob, is the person measuring, if you like, the second, uh, the same system, but at the time T2. So I call them Alice and Bob, just, just to make it look like the standard spatial Bell inequality. So what I do is, is, um, is I make a distance, I measure, I express it as a distance, uh, but you can think about this distance as one minus the trace norm of, or, or all of these norms, if you like, distances agree if they are reasonably defined for these things. So basically, what I have in mind is that I measure one observable at T1 and then slightly rotated observable at T2. So they should be almost maximally correlated. The distance should be almost zero between them, but not quite. That's what I'm going to do. In the limit, the distance will become zero. But I'm going to squeeze as many measurements on the block sphere, if you like, as I can. So first I measure one observable slightly rotated at the next T1. Then on the next element, 
I start with this um, second observable, I rotate it by a little bit. And I keep doing these gradual, tiny rotations. And what a distance, if this was the usual Euclidean, if this obeyed the laws, if you like, of Euclidean distances and norms, you would expect that going from A1 to B1, B1 to A2, then A2 to B2, and so on, and add them all of these things up, should be bigger than or equal to the distance directly between the first measurement and the last measurement. And I call them A1 and Bn. doesn't matter. N is some large number. Like I said, I'm going to take some limit where n goes to infinity. Now, in quantum mechanics, these guys scale as 1 over n squared. So basically, the, the, the correlation, the distance between these measurements goes as the sine of the angle squared, uh, which means when angle is small, when n is large, they basically, each of these terms gives me 1 over n squared. And there are n of these terms, which means ultimately I get 1 over n uh, scaling on the left-hand side. And when n goes to infinity, this goes to zero. But, but I can re uh, arrange the whole setting so that the first measurement, the blue measurement here, pointing up, and the last measurement pointing down are actually orthogonal to one another in some sense. So I can make the distance... As in, in, in this sense, that means that, that the distance, if you like, is one because the overlap between the two is, is zero. So suddenly I'm, I'm in a situation where the left-hand side goes to zero, but the right-hand side, um, which should be normally under Euclidean norm uh, uh, smaller than, than, than the left-hand side, in fact now becomes maximally large. It's equal to one unit. So zero is greater than or equal to one, if you like. And that's your violation, if you like, of temporal Bell inequality um, through this kind of logic. So it's very closely related to the pseudo-density matrix. And I'm just saying it's somehow a consequence. We can think of this as a consequence of the fact that there is a negative eigenvalue in that pseudo-density matrix. It's very simple. I don't want to show you that now because I will get into, into experiments very briefly in a, in a moment. Uh, we did some experiments with Marco Genovese's group in Turin, and I think um, I can show you uh, they're, they're very simple simulations of what I have. Uh, but, yeah, go there, ahead. There is one question for Marcia, so if you can. Of course, Sorry. of course, of course. Okay. Marcia, you must uh, unmute yourself, so if you want. Good question. Okay, can you go back yeah. to the previous? Yeah, one? now it's now, now yes. it's better. Yeah, uh, this one or the one no, before? The, that one, that one, this one. Um, so, um, I'm not exactly sure of the language you're using, but um, I want to know if this this pattern can be um, interrupted in in mid mid equation to do one other thing briefly and then resume. Like, um, uh, uh, like this jumping off of um, can, yes, can... yes. Actually, this could include um, uh, this could be done in many different ways. Um, okay. um, usually, the way I think about it is that uh, much like with pseudo density, I prepare an ensemble of qubits identically, mm -hmm. um, and then on the first qubit, uh, I measure a one. Mm -hmm. And on the second qubit, I measure B1. Uh, on yes. the second instance, sorry, the same qubit. And then I could repeat this a number of times to get the statistics. And then I move, just like in Bell inequality, each of the measurements, you know, A1, B1, A1, B2, in, in the standard CHSH Bell inequality. So you need an ensemble, and you divide an ensemble into, in this case, I guess, N sub-ensembles. And in each of these N sub-ensembles, you make enough measurements to get a good estimate of each of these terms. So this in, involves a lot of um, a lot of repetitions, but but in each repetition, if you like, you are measuring correlations between different observables in T one and T two. That that's kind okay. of the idea. 
So it's a standard bell inequality setting, but with one qubit at two different times. Okay, now we have um, like an AI. Um, you can, so you have these these um, measurements, and, you, and you're going like say you're going forward, a laser or something, yes. and and you come to an object. Um, can you in A one? I forget the name of the lesson that um, the A one class they had recently. But you you back up, you get the um, the matrix to back up and then go forward again. So that would be like redirecting. Yes, you can even do that. That's a good question. In fact, uh, I wasn't um, um, paying attention to that particular aspect because I think in time, uh, this is not as much an issue as in space. In space, I think what people would do in order to eliminate as many hidden variable theories as possible, uh, they would really try to randomize the choice of the observables as much as possible. Okay. So whether you measure the first element here or the third element or the seventh element would actually be in space. It would be done in as random way as possible. In fact, you would take you would take a quantum random number generator to even tell you which correlation you should measure. And you can certainly do this here. You can do it in any order you like, as exactly as you suggested. Okay, um, and then you can then you can have the original matrix come back and meet again. Absolutely, that's it. Great, thank you. Yes. It's a, it's a great point because um, uh, somehow in time, I wasn't really, I just wanted to show that it's interesting that this um, um, a triangle inequality gets maximally violated. Uh, but I, I wasn't trying to necessarily imply from that that, uh, that I'm eliminating certain classical hidden variables. Mm -hmm. Certainly some classical hidden variables are eliminated already by this. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think it's, it's not it's not as robust as the as the spatial qubits. So, so somehow it doesn't really matter for this point that I'm communicating. But it's a very but good but question. You can merge the two. You can, you can, okay. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So let me not spend time on the experiment now because we may come come back to it. Um, but let me just let me just show you the generalization of this. Um, and so what I mentioned before is that. You can now extend this to any number of measurements in space and any number of measurements in time. So that's ultimately, you know, the pseudo density matrix of the universe would contain all measurements that you could have done in space, a bit like Einstein's block universe, that, that everything, all of these things are sitting already um, laid out in front of you in one, this, one big array of numbers that simply contains all possible correlations that you could have obtained by making measurements. Of course, there's a question of the resolution in space, resolution in time, how close they are, and I'm not asking any of these questions. I'm simply saying you could, in principle, mathematically extend this. So here is a very simple extension, just one, one step um, beyond what we talked about. We talked about two qubits, which was one qubit measured at T1, and the same qubit measured at T2. But now I have two qubits, two genuine qubits in space. And the second of these, the one sitting at x2, is measured twice in time. So this, in my description, the pseudo density looks like three qubit density matrix. It has qubit at x1 and x2 at t1, and it has a qubit at x2, but measured at t2. So at the moment, I'm not looking at any dynamics. I'm really looking in the at the simplest case. The qubits are not moving. They are sitting where they are. The time flows and passes, if you like. And even in this description, I'm not assuming any, any dynamics between T1 and T2, just to make it simple. We can include all of these things, and I haven't done that, but, but you can. Um, and now this looks like a pseudo-density matrix with, with three qubits. So we are starting, let's say, with a maximally entangled two qubits in space. Then, through our measurements, you can think of them as maximally entangled in time. And also, x1 and t2 become maximally entangled in time. So if you looked at this, if you looked at this density, uh, pseudo-density matrix, it looks almost like a legitimate three-qubit density matrix, other than this fact that you're going to have perfect correlations in time um, between the, the second qubit measured twice, and also between the first qubit measured the first time and the second qubit measured the, uh, the second time. So it's interesting. 
And you can, I don't want to bore you with all the details, but you can write it with the same tensor product structure. It will now contain three terms as well. There will be the two terms uh, correlations like x1, x2, y1, y2, and so on. But there will also be x1, x2, and x3. So that means I measured x1 here on the first qubit, measured x2 on the second qubit, both at t1, and then x3 is the measurement at t2 of the second qubit. And why does it have a minus sign? For exactly the same reason as it had a, uh, basically, a, 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 as you would expect, it has a minus sign because these two qubits have a negative correlation here. I'm assuming they're spatially, maximally entangled. And then there is a perfect correlation in time between them. So T1 and T2 will be perfectly correlated for, for both of the qubits, if you like. And you can put it all together into this, into this kind of, and you can extend it to any. I think this slide, again, I didn't want to show you in, in all generality, but this slide can extend to any number of spatial qubits measured any number of times. It's like an uh, array, a space-time, if you like, volume of events, each of which arises from making a measurement on different qubits at different points in space and different instances in time. It's really a space-time diagram of quantum correlations. And, and the beauty of that, I think that's maybe what surprised us when we, when we teamed up uh, for this paper, Jonathan Jones did the experiments with NMR, uh, and, and Joe and I uh, did the theory for this. And basically, what surprised us really is that um, all of the standard rules, that's why we thought that pseudo-density matrix, even though it's not the proper density matrix, there's a negative eigenvalue or negative eigenvalues in general uh, to live with, um, it has all the other features that we like from density matrices, namely, if you want to obtain the pseudo-density matrix of any subsystem, what you need to do um, is trace all the other subsystems. Trace out everything that you don't care. Just like when you have two qubits, if you want a single qubit density, you just trace out um, the state of the second qubit, and that gives you the single qubit. It's exactly the same story in time. You can trace out any number of qubits in space and time, and whatever remains is your genuine reduced density matrix um, of the remaining uh, uh, spatial and temporal qubits. So that's interesting. And I, I'm saying all of this now because there is an interesting question, there, and I think we used it for quantum information purposes, but I think there is a more mileage that we can maybe get you can now ask the following question. What if someone gives you the full description? Someone gives you the pseudo-density matrix of the universe. Someone says, here is a catalog of all the correlations that you're ever going to observe spatially and temporally. Could you actually distill, distill meaning could you mathematically separate space from time in this description? So I simply give you a pseudo-density matrix. I don't even tell you which components belong to space, which components belong to time. I simply give you um, an n, 2 to the n, whatever is the number, qubit state. And I don't tell you whether two qubits are related in a temporal way, whether it's the same qubit measured twice, or whether they are really two different qubits, spatially, maybe even measured at the same time. Uh, remember, I'm speaking non-relativistically, so on top of it, you would have to add symmetries if you, if you, but I think that that shouldn't be a problem. And it's interesting because negativity of eigenvalues simply signals the presence of temporal correlations. If you didn't have any temporal correlations in your description, then your correlations would simply constitute a genuinely bona fide uh, density matrix. And you would never get anything negative. And that would tell you that all of your measurements are really done in space. And these are all space-like events, if you like. However, as soon as you see a negative eigenvalue, that automatically signals to you that there is a temporal component. The problem is that this doesn't work the other way around. So this is a sufficient condition for temporal correlations. But it's not necessary in the following sense. 
your temporal correlations could also, they don't always have to give you a negative eigenvalue. They could also look like genuine spatial correlations. And that also surprised us. So basically, what I showed you was a maximally, um, maximally correlated, maximally entangled, if, if, if you permit me to abuse the language. It's a maximally entangled state in time. The qubit entangled with itself at a later time, maximum. All the correlations are maximum. And that, of course, leads to a negative eigenvalue. But if you reduce your correlations, and I think I have a slide on that as well, you can actually end up getting genuine physical states in time. And then, of course, you can no longer separate space and time. So somehow, if, 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 if someone gives you the pseudo-density matrix of the universe, unless you have extra information, you're not going to be faithfully able to cut it, slice it into a spatial part, spatial correlations and temporal correlations. I think that's interesting as well. H here is this example that I said that measurements in time could look like measurements in space. So what I'm doing now, it's another generalization, but actually generalization to three temporal measurements. I'm measuring with single qubit now, still single qubit. These are the most interesting examples. At T1, T2, and T3. And I'm calling this subsystem 1, subsystem qubit, subsystem 2, and qubit subsystem 3. The same module. And these sigma operators are the x, x plus y, y plus z, z. It's just that, the, you know, if I wrote out all the correlations, they would be just too cumbersome. It would be a, a very big expression. So I simply wrote the correlations in a more compact way. So now I'm measuring qubits, but unlike the, the first time I talked about, what I introduce between the two measurements is a channel. And for simplicity, I'm looking at the maximally depolarizing channel. So eta is the factor by which I depolarize the, the state in all three directions simultaneously and equally. So z goes into eta z, y goes into eta y, and x goes into eta x. It's what we call a a, a, a Depolar symmetrically, if you like, isotropically depolarizing channel. And I do the same between the measurement two and three. So basically, I start in a cube with a qubit. I make a measurement at T1. I depolarize it to T2. I make a measurement. I depolarize it again by the same channel to T3, and I make a measurement. And th this is my pseudo-density matrix. And now here is an interesting statement. Maybe oh, just please. one question. Because there is a, please okay, do, please so, do. I think this might be a good point as well to ask. I have a there is... Why are the eta for sigma 1, 3 and sigma 1, 2, 3 squared and the other not? Oh, great question. Because, uh, because between 1 and 3, it's gone through the channel twice. Ah, okay. There was you the literally depolarize it by one, one more time. You send, you know, x to eta x and then again to eta times eta x, if you like. And it's the square reduction. Okay. That's it. It's a good point. Thank you. And now if you, again, this requires a little bit of mathematics. Um, not really difficult because we're still talking about uh, relatively small this is an eight by eight. It's a three cube, an eight by eight matrix. But in fact, most of the elements of this matrix, it, it's, I think someone mentioned the sparse matrix. It, most of the elements are missing, of course. So, so it's not even difficult to, to diagonalize. And what you can now, uh, uh, look at is the procedure that I mentioned before. What if I trace out qubit number three? I get a state of qubits one and two. What if I stay, trace out qubit number two? I get one and three and so on. And if you have eta in this region, um, then the following thing is interesting. Each of the reduced two qubit states, one, two, two, three, and one, three, are positive operators as well. So even though they come from temporal measurements of one and the same qubit, because I depolarize them enough, they actually suddenly I've diminished the negative eigenvalue and I've squashed it down to zero, if you like, if you want to think about it mathematically in this way. So I make each two qubit state perfectly legitimate. There's no negative eigenvalue. However, all three qubits, if you look at the full pseudo density matrix, 
it still contains negative eigenvalues. If you diagonalize that thing, you will get negative eigenvalues. And that's very interesting. Why is this interesting? Because um, those of you that are familiar with um, with the notion of, um, um, I guess, Bell's inequalities are one aspect of that, but people call this contextuality. So in the sense that quantum mechanics, um, because of the non-commutativity of different observables, the context matters, whether I first measure X and then Y or vice versa, will give me different outcomes. Because the first measurement, of course, changes the state uh, of the system, as we discussed. And you can think of contextuality in quantum mechanics in the following way. There are all sorts of um, inequalities written down in this in this form. I guess they call them Koch and Spechter. There are all sorts of names that are ultimately all the same in the same spirit as Bell's inequalities. Bell's inequalities are also revealing contextuality of quantum mechanics, if you want to think like that. So here is interesting. Um, normal spatial contextuality, you would say that reduced states of, let's say, five qubit systems, any two reduced states could be described by classical hidden variables, but altogether they cannot. They cannot come out of a probability distribution. That's a contextuality. So that means locally things look classical, but if you want to capture all the statistics on all of these quantum systems together, you are forced to introduce a quantum mechanical state. That's one way of thinking about contextuality. And in fact, the same thing happens in time. That's what's interesting. So the fact that the reduced states have a quantum description now, not classical, quantum, but the whole thing doesn't have a quantum description, is a signature of time. It's a signature that your correlations contain temporal correlations. And I find that very interesting. So the way that contextuality, the way that you cannot capture everything with quantum, um, with classical probability distributions, forces you in the standard contextuality to acknowledge quantum mechanics. Here, you are saying the fact that reduced states can be described quantumly, but the whole state cannot be quantum, forces you to acknowledge the existence of time. This sounds kind of interesting, time from correlations. So I gave it this big name, how to argue for the presence of time for, from correlations. Okay, let me now tell you a little bit about these things, and, and I think I can even stop there so we can have more discussions. One thing that also, that's maybe a quantum information way of understanding the difference between temporal states and spatial states is that the temporal states can violate monogamy, what we call monogamy of entanglement. So in space, um, if you have two qubits that are maximally entangled, they cannot be entangled to any other qubits in space. Uh, that's clear. And that's what we call monogamy of entanglement. Any entanglement between your entangled systems and something else is bound to reduce the entanglement between the original systems. That's what we call Pico. In, in some sense. Now, with pseudo densities, you can actually be maximally entangled to multiple qubits. And that's precisely because of this weird nature of correlations in time. So let me, let me say what monogamy says in general. I wrote it in terms of Bell inequality violation, but there are many other ways. It says something like the standard CHSH. It says something like if qubits one and two, B is the value of the Bell operator. Uh, the value of the bell for 1, 2 plus the value of the bell for 1, 3 cannot exceed 4 units, which is kind of the twice the classical limit of each of them. That's what monogamy says. So what this means is that if one of them exceeds the value 2, which is the classical limit, then the other one has to be below that. So this is exactly the trade-off. If one is quantum mechanical, if one is, let's say, 2 root 2, then the other one has to be exactly smaller than two by the same amount so that the sum cannot exceed number four. That's very interesting. And that can be proven formally for qubits. For pseudo densities, no longer true. You can have a maximum violation of Bell's inequalities in time, of course, between qubits one and two, 
and qubits one and three, they could give you each two times root two, which together is four roots two. And actually, that's the kind of experiment that we did. So I don't want to, you know, it's a standard of the optics experiment, and this was done in, in, in Turin, like I said, where basically you have a laser pulse that generates entangled photons. They're entangled in polarization. The state you get is something like horizontal, horizontal plus vertical, vertical. And then the way that they are simulating the statistics that we need is that they measure one of the qubits, this qubit going down, only once, that's your qubit one, but the qubit, the physical qubit number two is measured first once to produce the first temporal qubit and then the second time, which is called qubit two and qubit three in this picture. So that's exactly, if you like, the diagram that I had here. It's exactly that. Uh, two physical qubits, two photons, one measured only once and the other one measured twice in succession. And from that, we basically estimate, uh, of course, after doing an ensemble measurement or, or, on, on many identically prepared uh, um, uh, maximally entangled photons. Uh, so these are very simple experiments, as you know, all with linear optics involving things like half wave plates, as you can see, and polarization dependent beam splitters. So basically, you need to be able to measure Z direction and you need to be able to rotate it with these half wave plates and quarter wave plates into other bases and by that you can measure all the correlations you like. And I don't want to again bore you too much with 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 the uh, with the experimental. I think I have some very beautiful tomographic plots as well and I'm gonna go very quickly through that. But what we thought was interesting to um, present this as is the simulation, there's a big discussion in some circles. I think this goes back to uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity, if you like. What happens if you, if you have, um, if you have space times that may allow what people call, uh, open or closed time like loops? So if you have a qubit that can really enter some kind of region of space time, go backwards in time, if you like, come backwards in time in this. So basically, qubit number two hits some kind of region of space time. No one knows, of course, whether this exists and whether this even makes any sense. But many people have worried that if you try to quantize these time-like loops, you're going to run out. You're going to run into violation of monogamy of entanglement. And we thought pseudo-density matrices might be perfect for this because they exactly allow violation of monogamy of entanglement. So if you think of Q1 and Q2 as two qubits, which are spatial, but the Q2 qubit is a probe that goes through a closed time-like loop. So it basically goes through backwards in time and then again forwards in time, if you like, in this very simple image. Then... What people worried is that if Q1 and Q2 are maximally entangled, and because Q3 ends up inheriting the state of Q2, then Q1 and Q3 are also maximally entangled. It seems like you're going to be violating monogamy. By the way, people who talk about firewalls and all sorts of stuff like that, I, I don't know if any of that makes any sense, by the way, but I'm just, I, I know that the, the, these discussions exist, are encountering very similar issues or they think they're encountering. I don't know whether these issues are real. But they also think that some kind of poking radiation of operation of, the, of a black hole would also get you into trouble with monogamy of entanglement. And these firewalls are artificial introductions um, of some kind of decoherence that would actually remove, kill entanglement in order not to violate monogamy. But in fact, if you think of qubits Q2 and Q3 as the same qubit, but measure the two different instances in time, you automatically remove this difficulty. There's no more difficulty because monogamy uh, is not relevant. You can be maximally entangled in time as many times as you like, if you, if you like. There's no, no, no problem there. And I think lots of these things we published in various journals. I think that picture may even be from uh, Nature Communications and so on. And all of these are very simple experiments, ultimately. They are really 
they're really more like simulations and proof of principle. Of course, you know, no qubit in this experiment went to a closed time like loop and backwards in time and so on. But the reconstructed state could be presented as one of the states that could arise out of a process like that. So the only thing it says is that it may be this kind of space-time formulation of quantum mechanics may be useful under some of these very unusual scenarios. So let me not let me not take you through all of these, like I said, um, estimates of how you measure all of these photons in detail and so on. I think Fabrizio, who did this experiment a couple of years back, was kind enough to give me all of these plots, but I, I, I don't think we need to go through them. These are the violations of the monogamy showing that you can actually uh, have correlations between 1, 2, and 2, 3, which exceed uh, uh, 4 units in, in this kind of CHSH uh, language and so on. Here is, here is one of the last things I, I want to say before I, before I conclude. And why I, why I called it the pseudo density matrix formulation. How can one think about dynamics in this picture? So far, I talked about measurements in times, uh, in, in dif at different times, different spatial locations. I said, if there is any dynamics in between, you can include it into the den pseudo density matrix. And now what is interesting is that you can think of the pseudo-density matrix in order to, to recover conventional dynamics, qubit evolving from T1 to T2 to T3 and so on. You can actually think of this pseudo-density matrix as a maximally entangled state in space-time. So it's, you can actually think of dynamics, conventional dynamics, as a teleportation in time not from qubit one to qubit two in space, but from time one, and we think of it as a qubit at T1, to time two as a qubit in two. It's a teleportation in time. And I deliberately wrote it the same way as we think about teleportation. Here is the state to be teleported, any state psi. Here is the pseudo-density matrix stretching across time. So the state comes at, at time T1. This is the pseudo-density matrix connecting, let's say, T1 and T2, or T2 and T3, doesn't matter. And you can rewrite this in exactly the same trick as the teleportation, as a maximally entangled pseudo-density matrix between 1 and 2, leaving the state, and it's corrected, if you like, corrected variance at time T3. So it's very interesting. So at least mathematically, it looks like you can think of these space-time correlations in a pseudo-density matrix as given to you as a background, as an entangled background. And those of you that may be familiar with the cluster state quantum measurement-based quantum computation will see that I'm doing the same thing. I'm doing the same thing in time, actually. It's a sequence of teleportations. And maybe it's not a surprise if you know, if you know these connections. So you can recover the standard dynamics. There's no problem with that, which is why I'm saying ultimately this picture can be made to be completely identical to the usual formulation. It gives you a different picture of what's going on because there is this entangled network of spatial uh, temporal qubits and somehow the, the, the qubit that you bring to this network will then interact with different qubits in the network and evolve in this way. So that, that's kind of how you, you can think of uh, evolution. Um, again, the, you know, this in a sense has not been said this way before, but these connections between relativity um, and and simply the qubit, the SU2 representation, um, are well known, at least in, 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 in many circles. And you can think of this teleportation of a state. And here I'm even saying you can teleport the state through an imperfectly entangled um, uh, channel, which means that the state that comes out will not even necessarily be faithful to the original state. Unlike in so it's a bit like doing teleportation with a non-maximally entangled state. And you can do that in time as well. In which case, your qubit as it evolves also decoheres, changes in time. And this is interesting because these transformations in time of qubits do have a, a perfect analogy there with Lorentz transformations. And I think, 
you know, these kind of speculations that the that space is three dimensional because qubits are also three dimensional. They require three real numbers to be specified. Exist from I don't even know who the first person is to to postulate uh, something that Weizsäcker usually gets credited with these kind of spe speculations. David Bond thought a lot this way. Penrose for sure with twisters and, and all of that stuff. John Wheeler, you know, eat from bit and, and all of that stuff. So I think it would be interesting to explore this. Like I said, I never thought about it relativistically so far. I, I simply thought about the, you know, Galilean, Newtonian fixed background and I wasn't worrying about the, the symmetries at all. However, you could put the symmetries on top and then it's interesting what kind of things you might, um, you might get. Uh, maybe I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't, uh, bore you too much with this and maybe leave, um, um, uh, a few minutes for, for a few other questions. I just want to, uh, want to make a connection with two other approaches. Um, something, an approach which also extends over time, and I alluded to it very briefly before, is what we call a two state formalism. So it's the one which gives you the forward propagating state. Uh, and the backward propagating state, and they meet somewhere in the middle. So that's known as the two-state formalism. Uh, your state now stretches also across time. It has to be given at the final boundary, the initial boundary, and then propagated one backwards and one forwards in time. It looks like, as I wrote it, it's written as a projector, but, um, but basically, of course, it looks extremely non-local, uh, if you like, simply because you are now acknowledging that there are signals from the future that are determining uh, things in the present. And it's interesting, here, in the, in the pseudo-density matrix uh, formalism, what you are violating, like I said, is the positivity. It's no longer a positive operator in general. Here, it's no longer actually a Hermitian operator. That's what's interesting. So, as you can see, um, this is just one off diagonal element, if you like. Um, uh, and, and if you take the conjugate, it represents the exact reverse of this process. So, of course, if you add the conjugate and this, you will get the Hermitian operator. But if you only write it in one direction, that your input state is psi, your measured output state is phi, then that itself, of course, is not a, is not a valid physical state. But what you're breaking is not positivity, you're breaking hermicity, if you like. And, and, and that's, again, the price to pay for trying to include um, a description that stretches across time and, and, and involves multiple times. So that's one interesting connection, maybe, uh, here. And the other, I think this goes back to an early question, um, uh, which, which is another approach. I just want to flag this two up and then I will stop. Um, there is a possibility to encode temporal correlations into spatial correlations and therefore not violate anything. Simply preserve the hermicity and the positivity of your uh, density matrices. And it would go something like this. If you have a qubit that I was, this first line represents a qubit propagating in time. But instead of just saying I measure it here and I measure it here, the way I do this, and I think that's what's related to one of the questions. That's why I don't like collapse, actually. I subscribe to this kind of view. The first measurement is nothing but a controlled gate between the first qubit and the second qubit. So it's a unitary transformation that perfectly correlates in whatever is the relevant basis. If it's a control knot, I'm measuring the Z basis, if you like, of the first qubit. So it basically records the value of Z of the first qubit into the second qubit. And then I can do a second measurement at a later time. So basically, the, the, the state I obtain, the reduced state of these qubits I obtain here is, is a genuinely okay physical state of two qubits. But what they contain, what they can contain, if you like, is the two measurements at two different times of one and the same qubit. And some people are promoting this kind of encoding. So again, of course, you need an ensemble measurement because every time you measure different things, you need to use two new extra qubits to encode this correlation. 
So XX measurements would be included into two qubits, then XY measurement would be two other qubits and so on. Again, you need an ensemble as big as the number of correlations that you need to encode in this case. But, so you, you are enlarging your space. There is a lot of redundancy here. You need many memory qubits. However, you're not paying any price. You're not breaking the positivity or the hemicity of your description. And your reduced state now simply contains all the relevant correlates. So that's also been investigated. And clearly, all of these approaches are somehow um, related to one another. You can always go from one approach and rephrase it as another approach, simply because all of them capture one and the same quantum mechanics. So let me summarize it very briefly, and then, then I'm hoping we can have a, a few minutes of, of, uh, of um, final questions, maybe as well. The key idea is to treat different time instances like modes. Uh, I talked about qubits mainly because I think it's the simplest to understand. It's, it's the easiest experimentally because we have so many qubit platforms actually now. It's, it's really developed with multiple, not just with two or three qubits. We can do many more these days. You can extend this to what people call continuous variables, if you like, harmonic oscillators, which would go towards field theory. So I, I could have talked about X and P measurements. I could have measured the first harmonic oscillator, then measured, measured it again at a later time, put this together, and you would get exactly the same violation of positivity as you get for qubits. You would get perfect correlations between XX and PP measurements instead of anti-correlation. So it's exactly, you will get the an anti-EPR state if you measured one harmonic oscillator twice in time and constructed a physical state out of that. And of course, this brings many other questions. How do we phrase mutual information in time? How do we really talk? Are there measures, are there the usual measures that we think about um, for spatial qubits, uh, various entropies, entanglement measures, and so on, given that these temporal correlations very strongly resemble the things that we get in space, could we translate all of these measures into the temporal domain? How do we do that? And of course, the obstacle here is the negativity, the possible negativity of these states. How do we deal with that? And, and that may prevent us from using some of these measures. And then, of course, um, how do we relate this to other, I mentioned in my colleague, Honor, uh, who basically is thinking about relating this to the two-state formalism, to other formalism. I think this is very interesting, at least just to um, to play around with these formalisms and see how they connect. Because, like I said, they tell you different stories about how to describe um, dynamics, but ultimately, of course, they all should at least agree with quantum mechanics as far as we're away. So I'm going to stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Vladko. Uh, yes, so now it's time for uh, Q&A session and uh, we had two questions on our chat and I think that Marcia also wanted to ask a question. So first a question from, uh, from Jervis. Uh, when you talk about reducing correlation, are you trying to eliminate uh, entanglement? Are you trying to eliminate noise? Uh, good question. Um, I think I think in these experiments, of course, you want to get as high a fidelity as possible, simply because I think some of the points there were, were to show that you can get a maximum violation uh, of, of some of these inequalities in time as well. Then, of course, it, 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 it pays to have um, as little noise between the two measurements. Uh, what, what I mean is extra noise. Of course, your measurement already you can think of as is changing the state of the system, but you don't want any further noise on top of that. Um, that's certainly the case in experiments. If you, on the other hand, want to implement, there was a question about this eta parameter, the one that you have um, an isotropically and equally depolarizing channel, then of course, you will produce that in an experiment in some way. You could do it by entangling your system to another system to a sufficiently high degree that you reproduce uh, this eta parameter. That's one way of, of, of doing it. But generically, I think you do want as good a control of your system as, as in quantum information process. All right, great, thank you. Uh, so Marcia, you can ask next. Yes, um, 
can we introduce matter into the equations? Uh, that's a, yeah, that's an, an excellent question to, I think that would go in this direction of, uh, of making this into a proper, um, field theory of sorts, right? To really do, uh, to go into maybe the, the full, uh, quantum field theory description. Um, in that case, of course, you could do, uh, you could do both, let's say the electromagnetic field and you could think of some matter field. Um, uh, to do this. Um, my feeling is that the answer is yes. I I, I haven't done that. Um, I haven't gone further than just what I was talking about, um, discrete measurements of harmonic oscillators. But it seems to me you should be able to capture any field in this way as well. Um, of course, there are all sorts of uh, very deep questions then that you might... Uh, come up against, which I wasn't worried about at all, which is to do with the resolution of your measurements um, in space and time. And, 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 you know, there may well be limits uh, to various resolutions uh, of this kind. And this would certainly impact how you write these pseudo-density images. Um, with qubits, I was just assuming that you can do this arbitrarily. You can really choose uh, the time interval uh, any way you like. But I think there could well be limitations to that. And I think that's what you'd be facing in, in, in proper field here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, Marcia, thanks for the question. I hope that it answered your question. Yes, thank you. Thanks. So the next is a question from George. How do irreversible processes fit in? Uh, so many particles that your matrix is very large and entropy increases with time. Or would it be an, an eternal ergodic process without initial or final boundary? I uh, know it's a great question. I think I think it would be the first that if you at least if you look at this simple example that I gave with the depolarizing channel, then the way you would think about the um, increase of entropy in time is exactly uh, remember that the tracing. Uh, out procedure works perfectly well. So if you want the state of a qubit at uh, time t1, um, but you have all the other times, you simply need to trace out and remove all the all the qubits from all other times before and after. And that leaves you with a single, the usual uh, density matrix um, of your system at, at whatever the time is that you want. And if you if you look at this forward in time, if you do that at, at uh, you know, row at T1, at T2, and so on, I think you will indeed, um, as you say, uh, you will recover some kind of uh, increase in entropy, providing that what you said is true, that your evolution in that direction indeed is, um, is completely, uh, is somehow entropy increasing. If it's unitary, then obviously the, the entropy will simply in that limit be preserved. But in general, I think if, if your system is entangling to other systems, it certainly uh, will be uh, will be entropy increasing. The, the interesting thing with boundaries is that for you to conclude this, you really need to be given the direction. Because if all I've given you really is the pseudo-density matrix, and I didn't even tell you, even if I told you what is time and what is space in this description, uh, you wouldn't necessarily know which way the time flows. You could equally well say, why don't I trace all the qubits other than the last qubit, and then all the qubits other than the second to last qubit, and now what am I observing? You know, could now the entropy um, start decreasing? And I think the answer is yes. So, so, so that's that would be interesting here. The directionality uh, would still somehow be put in by hand. Because the pseudo density, if you just give it as as, as one big matrix, it, it doesn't really tell you anything about which way the time flows. So I think that's a very nice question. Um, but you could encode the usual um, what we call open system um, dynamics, and and any kind of entropy evolution could be mimicked in this way. But if you only have the pseudo density, you probably couldn't tell. Um, you couldn't always tell. Sometimes you may be able to tell. Okay, thank you. And then we have a question from Fahed. Uh, what are the potential applications for PDMs? Uh, the one one application which I think is um, is in physical review letters. Um, I wrote it with um, 
um, um, Joe Fitzsimons, I think Johnson was on that, um, uh, Paul Pisacek was uh, on that as well. I think uh, it's a, it's an, it's a, it, it's an immediate application to um, channel capacities in quantum information. So if you want to put a bound on on how much you can communicate between different parties, then what we traditionally use um, is standard, like I said, measures like mutual information. What is the mutual information between the input and the output? And the mutual information tells you, in fact, how correlated the input and output are. And as you know from Shannon, th this is the measure of uh, the right measure for channel capacity. However, in many of these quantum cases, um, you have to really think hard what the right measure is for these kind of correlations. Of course, there is the quantum mutual information and all sorts of instances of that. But what we found in this PRL is, I think, an example of a communication where this pseudo density, the negativity of the pseudo density matrix, gives you a stronger constraint. It shows you a stronger bound on, on how many bit, how many qubits, if you like, you could communicate um, than the standard entropic measures. So, in, in that sense, it can be useful as a tool um, for for quantum information. My hope uh, is that similar thing. I, again, it's something I haven't I haven't done, but I I always thought it's a good question in fact, that that you're asking because. I think similar things could be done with computation as well. Because obviously, I mean, computation is simply evolving uh, state of a bunch of qubits um, through certain gates forward in time. And I think this kind of neg negativity could also possibly tell you about something um, to do with the efficiency of quantum computations. Again, uh, bounding the correlations between the input and the output. So I think it wouldn't surprise me if we at least recover some of the known bounds. I, I don't know if we could improve them. That would, of course, be much better as an application. But I think we could at least recover them uh, in mm -hmm. this formulation. I, I haven't thought about that at all. OK. Uh, there's also a question from YouTube. Uh, is there any correlation between the PDM and Gordon Klein equation that led to negative probabilities that were resolved okay. by Dirac equation? Again, great question. Actually, this is a great question. Unfortunately, again, I haven't thought enough about that because you are right. That there is a um, there is a great way of of getting rid of uh, negativities that we potentially get um, in in field theory um, simply by postulating that these are um, that these are antiparticles, if you like. Um, so they carry. Uh, they, they always carry positive energy, but they, but they're simply they have the the opposite charge of the of the particles. And and what does the trick is what we call second quantization, right? So you simply upgrade the wave function, what you think of as the wave function in this relativistic fir first quantized wave equation. You upgrade that into an operator, and now you are creating and annihilating these particles. And that does the trick. I interestingly enough, that if you diagonalize that, um, you will always uh, providing you interpret things in, 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 in this way, you will always get rid of these negative um, negative values. Uh, it seems to... Uh, I frequently thought also what would happen if you if you thought about second quantizing the pseudo-density matrix. You can really treat these guys in that way as well, since I'm anyway uh, promoting them as being modes. And, and, and I haven't, uh, I, I can't give you an answer. I, I think it's a great question as well to investigate. Uh, what would be the genuine field theory um, formulation uh, of this kind of description? And, and would it then, would it give some extra meaning to the, to the negative eigenvalue as well? I don't know. That, that would be great. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that Sebastian wanted to ask a question. So Sebastian, you can unmute. Yes, yeah, so, so thanks at the beginning uh, for this uh, very good talk and give us. Sorry, seconds. Okay, let's let's wait. Uh, okay, so sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the beginning, uh, 
uh, you said about this uh, quantum field theoretical uh, description, because in my opinion, this uh, this formalism uh, is co most connected with something called relativistic quantum mechanics, which yes. we know that this yes. is not truly con correct uh, uh, when we speak spoke about uh, space time in a truly yes. way. But uh, yes. and, and there was a uh, many connection about quantum field theory in your answers, so maybe I skip this question, but I have a question that you said, as I understand, the going to the infinity with number of qubits doesn't resolve the problems. No. And, uh, but maybe uh, because uh, top is saying something about, about entanglement in quantum field theory is very hard. So maybe this uh, description can say something more with, uh, and true entanglement in the case where we have a lot of uh, qubits and a lot of huge systems. Yes. Y yes, you are right. Yeah, I I haven't thought about this at all, but but it could because somehow you get this extra degree degree of complexity when you're talking about infinitely dimensional systems. Uh, you you get what some people would call super entanglement and so on. And there are some interesting. You are right. I mean, you um. I think there is a lot of value in 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 doing a proper field theoretic treatment with this and really trying to generalize this in in this direction. Like I said, I haven't even thought about even qubits, um, but simply complying with with the special relativistic symmetries. Forget about uh, even the continuity and and the and and fields at the moment. Um, so even a stationary fixed number. Uh, of of qubits, but maybe thinking about the relativistic transformations between different measurements that you make and making that comply. That's one possibility. But of course, I think if you want to include the creation and annihilation of particles, which is which is a must, uh, relativistically speaking, then then I think you you have to ultimately do a uh, do quantum field theory. And I don't know. I I I would like what you say to be true that we could maybe even understand some of these intricacies. To do with entanglement in field theory to this format that would be interesting yeah and uh, the last question do you think that maybe formalis for a system algebra will be a better uh, way to describe these kinds of things what, what do you mean uh, in, uh, in what the, sense the, I, I mean that uh, you can uh, reformulate quantum mechanics by sister algebras yes Oh, C star algebras. Yes, sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear C star. Yes, um, I think that again, that's way, uh, way um, above um, any kind of mathematics that uh, that I'm familiar with. Um, I, I've been exposed to C star algebra only a little bit on on a, on a couple of occasions, and I understand that the one of the one of the advantages is really a. Uh, a formalism that uh, in which you can think about both classical and quantum mechanics in a in a unified way. So, so it's kind of useful for people who even think about hybrid systems. Maybe some of them quantum, and some of them classical. It, it's a unifying formalism. But I think it's also a, a formalism to deal with with some of the things you mentioned, which which come out of um, right infinite dimensionality and so on. So I don't, I, I can't intelligently answer the question because I don't really understand much of C star algebra. But I, I don't see again why you couldn't do this kind of formulation in this way, given that you know I'm, I'm using just the standard description of uh, of quantum systems, and I, I I would kind of again bet if, if I had to that that this is possible. But whether you gain anything by doing this here is is, is a different question. It, it's it's a good point. Thank you very much for your answer. Okay, uh, there's another question from Jordan. Uh, this is more of an abstract question. This formulation in terms of quantum teleportation in the application area of quantum communications, yes. it seems yes, it seems uh, like I can get around the coherence with using pseudo density matrix formulation in theory and capture the transmission qubit. Is this correct? Uh, no, I don't think you can you can include the coherence, uh, but I think you cannot really avoid it in the sense that whatever the output um, of your um, channel is, I, either in space or in time, because you can you can capture both, would simply be decohered by the same amount. 
Um, so if your if your correlations are imperfect in the pseudo density matrix, if they're not maximal, uh, like the the qubit that we had at the very beginning of the talk, then there is no way really to avoid that. Other than of course the standard way, which is to try to isolate the system, suppress decoherence, and so on. But the formalism itself would simply include and reflect uh, decoherence. Unfortunately, it would be nice if you could. If you could still recover the initial state, as you say, uh, by by using something like this, but I think it would give it the same result as uh, as the standard. Okay, thank you. AI. Yes, sure. Yes, yeah, I have a series of questions that have to do with chemistry. Namely, oh. anybody applied this to chemistry and moreover to biology like protein folding oh, or good cell, cell communication because that's a major interest of mine and i think this formulation is powerful enough to explain things that we don't understand there that sounds amazing i mean if you i mean if you could send me some references. The only thing I can comment on, I haven't thought about this at all, in fact, but but what I'm familiar with, because one of my uh, former uh, postdocs uh, is working on that, actually, Christian Schilling um, in, in Munich, he is uh, applying exactly measures of entanglement, um, but these are standard spatial entangled states. He hasn't gone into the temporal domain. And I think that's what you're suggesting. That would be interesting to investigate. But he applied the standard spatial measures in order to even redefine chemical bonding in this way. So you could actually you could actually classify different bonds in chemistry by talking about the amount of entanglement between electrons um, in different states. So he used full full methodology of, of quantum information to actually rewrite some of the basic things. In chemistry, I, I liked it very much. What's um, his last name? I'm sorry. Schilling, Christ, Christian Schilling. Schilling Spilling. is the last name. That's it. Schilling. Christian Schilling. That's it. Okay. And I, that's great. I missed some of your good talk for other reasons, but uh, did you deal with breaking symmetry at all? No. No. Okay, fine. No, because I know that breaking symmetry is invoked to do all kinds of discoveries when we get stuck. So it's I like see. tradition in science to do that. Yes. So I was wondering if this can be applied here. Again, good question, because like I said, I haven't even uh, gone far in this direction of trying to apply the conventional uh, symmetries. I think that would be good, but I, I, I haven't thought about that at all. But, but I think it's a good point. It's certainly worth looking at. Okay, enjoying your talk. Thank you so much. Thanks very and much. I'm sure everybody shared that feeling. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. I'm really happy to do this. And like I said, I'm I'm happy to um uh, to tu tune in at a later stage to tell you about something else if you if you enjoy these kind of things. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I can see that there is uh, just a general question from Frank. Can anybody recommend any proper discussion group about theoretical physics on the internet? So, uh, Vladka, I'm not sure if you can recommend some discussion groups, but if yes, maybe you can tell. So Frank said that he's trying to model electron spin theory. Anyway. Yes, uh, yes I'm not aware of anything, but I can drop you a line if, uh, if I find out. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, there's one comment from Peter, but it's not a question. So it seems that we've asked all the questions right. from the chat. Perfect someone... timing, I think. It's yes, well. perfect timing. I agree. Would someone like to ask maybe the last question? No. Okay. So right. I think we can finish for today. So Vladko, thank you once again. Thanks a lot. Uh, for great for this pleasure. great yes, great talk and answering all the questions. And thank you everyone for joining. And uh, yeah, we'll have the next meetup next weekend. Thanks on a Sunday. lot. So we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks a lot. Thanks. 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 Th